Folks, I don't have to tell you that, that in agriculture here we have a problem. You know, the Science News ran this article saying more than 57 billion tons of soil have eroded in the U.S. Midwest. 57 billion tons. That's, that's a huge amount of soil that we've lost. Uh, you know, concerned scientists tell us that the national soil erosion rates are on track to repeat Dust Bowl era losses eight times over. We didn't fix the problem coming out of the Dust Bowl. We haven't fixed our soil erosion problem. Now we tried, you know, here's Hugh Hammond Bennett in 1933 standing out in an eroded field and look at the look on his face. Just look how dejected he looks, depressed. And, and I hope that we all feel that way when we see a field that has serious erosion because we should be discouraged, we should be depressed because of the soil loss and degradation. And unfortunately, it's still happening today. You've all seen it, uh, hopefully just on your neighbor's farms and not, not on yours as much, uh, but it still does happen even on well-managed uh, soils and properties. So we have this problem of soil loss and degradation, and it's not just from water erosion, we have the wind erosion issue as well. Again, 1935 uh, here, but then uh, many of you, and, and I know we've got folks in here from Illinois, uh, this happened just this past year, 2023. I think six people lost their lives in this uh, tra traffic accident in Illinois. Yeah, Walter, eight people lost their lives. And it was because there was so much soil blown across the road that people couldn't see. And, and this it led to this uh, tragedy. And so we need to be better. We can be better. And in, in addition to the erosion issue, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, I know, but as a nation, we've lost more than half the organic matter in our soils. And you've probably seen pictures like this. You know, these are soils right across the fence line from each other. This is a farmer who's just been doing conventional tillage, uh, no cover crops, uh, no soil health practices whatsoever. Look at the difference in the color. Look at the difference in the structure. These soils started out the same. They're no longer the same. They're different. And it's all because of the management that's been applied. But unfortunately, there's a whole lot more of this out in the country than we have of this. And so we've got a big problem. And how do we solve this problem? How do we solve this problem of the continuing erosion of the loss of organic matter? You know, we're being told that we have to feed all these people. You know, the only solution is we have to rebuild our soils. We can't just stop the erosion and think that we're going to be okay. We have to do more than just stop erosion. We have to rebuild what has been lost. We have to reclaim what has been taken from us. And it's possible. We can do this. We can go from soil that looks like this, no structure, not a lot of carbon in it, to something like this that's highly structured, highly aggregated, lots of carbon in it. We can do this. Many of you have done this on your own operations. We can do this across a much larger scale. And it's a huge task. It's an enormous task because there's 900 million acres of cropland across the U.S. Now, that includes the grazing lands, but just because it's got perennials on it and you're grazing it does not mean that these things don't apply. Some of the most degraded soils in the world are perennial rangelands that have been poorly managed. And so there's about 300 million acres of crop ground to 600 million acres of rangeland or perennial, but they all, or most of them, have been degraded to some level or another. You can see a, a map of degradation there. Uh, it's a massive undertaking to try to think of how are we going to bring this back to the way that God created it. Well, when I think about a huge rebuilding project like this, my mind always goes back to the story of Nehemiah in the Bible. Because Nehemiah was faced with a, with a huge challenge and a huge task as well. And so what I want to do here this morning is take you through the story of Nehemiah. And we're going to look at the leadership principles that he applied to get his job done and see how we can apply them to our own issue of trying to rebuild our soils. So that's kind of the context of what we're going to do. We're going to look at the book of Nehemiah pull out some rich leadership lessons and apply them to what we're going to be doing here over the next several days, but really more importantly, what all of you have dedicated much of your life's work to as well. So a little bit of background before we jump in here. By, by the year 486, the Jews had been in the promised land for over 700 years, but for 490 of those years, they disobeyed a commandment that God had given them that talks specifically about giving the Sabbath rest, a Sabbath year of rest, 
uh, for the land. In Leviticus, uh, God tells the nation of Israel, when you come into this land which I shall give you, then you shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather its crop, but during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest. Now we'll talk more about this later, about how does that apply to us today, but for right now, think about it in the terms of, you know, back in 486 B.C. And so for 490 years, the Hebrews had essentially just ignored this commandment. They just said, eh, yeah, we'll just harvest every year. That land looks fine. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to notice. Well, you know what? God noticed. And so he says, uh, the, the punishment for this, part of the punishment, uh, the timing of the punishment anyway, is that they were going to be conquered by Babylon and, and carried off into exile. And the time frame of this exile was 70 years. One year for every one of those Sabbath years that they skipped. Uh, and it says the whole land will be a desolation. You will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And it's interesting, this comes from the book of Jeremiah, but this is a very famous passage. I've heard this quoted many times. Lots of graduating seniors choose this as their life verse. But I don't know that they understand the context of this. And I want to read it because I think it's really important because it, it should give us all encouragement. So this is all from the book of Jeremiah. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years have been completed, you know, when, when you've served your time, when you've paid the penalty, I will visit you and I will fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places where I've driven you. So he's, he's, he's sending them into exile as punishment, but he says, I will bring you back. And, and this fundamentally changed the Hebrew nation. It fundamentally changed the Jewish people. So that's, that's kind of the background of this. And that's why they, that's, they had many other sins as well, uh, idol worship and all manner of things. But the timing of the exile was all based on this Sabbath year rest. So in, four, in, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem. Uh, the Babylonians attacked them. They destroy the city. They burn down the temple. They break down the city walls, and they carry the people off into exile. King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon was the most powerful empire in the world. Uh, it's modern-day Iraq. You may have heard of them. It's the same land. It's the same, uh, same area there. And so this is the beginning of this 70-year period. Now, during this period, some stories that you're very familiar with, Daniel in the lion's den, happens during this time. Daniel would have been one of those Hebrews carried off into exile. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They would have been part of the Hebrews carried off into exile into Babylon. And then about 50 years later, in 539, Babylon falls to Persia. Nebuchadnezzar gets a little big for his britches, and the Persians come in. They conquer them, because now Persia is the most powerful country in the world. Persia is modern-day Iran. Okay, so conflict even way back then. And the Jewish exiles are moved over to Persia as part of the spoils of war. And so that's where we kind of start to pick up the, the story here. So the Cyrus, the Persian emperor, in the year 536, he issues a decree. And he says, hey, some of you Jews can return to your land. Now, there was no reason for him to have to do this. He had no obligation to do this. The only thing that I can consider is that God put it into his heart to say, let some people go back. So Zerubbabel leads the first wave of Jews to return. They rebuild the temple in the year 516, which is exactly 70 years after the exile started. So the temple was destroyed for exactly 70 years. That's not the end of the story. That doesn't mean everything was perfect after 70 years, but they had a place to worship again after 70 years. Now, 61 years later, Ezra leads a second group of people to return, and that consisted of about 1,500 men and their families, and that brings us up to the time of Nehemiah. So the year 445, a report comes to Nehemiah. So it's about 10 years after uh, Ezra takes all the people back. It's 111 years after the fall. It's about 30 years after Esther is made queen to, queen Artaxer to King Artaxerxes, to Xerxes. Uh, and, and about 30 years later, we read the story of Nehemiah. And so it starts out, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. This is Nehemiah 1, verses 1 through 3. So we have to kind of understand who this guy is. And he 
He's an amazing man. He's a great, great leader. And I want to draw out some principles of leadership based on his story. So he was a Jewish exile. I'm convinced he had never been to Jerusalem. He was likely born in Babylon during the captivity there, and then later taken to Persia uh, as part of the spoils of war. And he was a very humble man because at the end of verse 1, so he goes through this whole chapter, but at the end of chapter 1, he kind of throws this last little sentence in there, and it says, and I was the cupbearer to the king. Now that doesn't mean anything to us today because we don't understand what a cupbearer is, but it was a very important position because even back then there was all kinds of political intrigue and you know people were trying to assassinate the leader and take over and different political parties and blah 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 sounds way too familiar right and so one of the easiest ways to knock someone off was to poison them you'd poison their food you'd poison their wine and so the king would have people that would taste the food before it came to the king and then they'd watch that guy and see if he died if he died, obviously the king wouldn't eat the food. If he didn't die, then it was safe for the king to eat. In the same way with the wine, the cupbearer would bring the wine. He would drink it first. They would watch him, see if he was going to die. And if he didn't, then the king would drink it. And that's the position that Nehemiah had. So he was still a slave, but he was probably the most elevated slave in the whole kingdom because it was a position of great trust but not so much that, well, you're kind of dispensable. So they, they had a relationship between Nehemiah and the king. And so this is what we see in Nehemiah 1. Some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province are in great distress and great reproach, and the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And I believe it was at this point right here that Nehemiah understood that God was giving him the job, the project, to rebuild the walls. And I think he also understood how many challenges stood in his way of doing that. He'd never even been there. Why should he even care? But he did. And so we're going to look at the response that Nehemiah had to this and what can we learn from it. So we're going to learn that any big project whether it's rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, rebuilding our soils, or anything else that you're undertaking, it's going to require these three things. You're going to have to have the right leaders, you're going to have to have the right workers, and you've got to have the right tools. And if you can put those three things in place, you can do some pretty amazing things. So what are the characteristics of the right leaders? Well, number one, they care deeply. No leader is very good unless they care deeply. Look at what Nehemiah did. He specifically asked these people. So these people came through. He was in the capital, Susa, and the, he knew these people were from Jerusalem, and they were passing through, and he specifically asked them, how are things going? Now, he didn't have to do that. He'd never been there. He didn't, he didn't necessarily have to do that. So, you know, Sometimes I know that there may be things wrong with people, but I don't ask, not because I don't care so much, as I don't feel like I have the time to help. And that's a pretty poor attitude. I will admit that. I don't care enough to ask sometimes, but Nehemiah did. He asked how they were doing. And then when he heard the report, oh, it's terrible. The walls are broken down. And essentially what he was saying is that every time we try to do something, because we have no walls, the walls were the only defense that a city like that had, People come in and steal our stuff. They, they, they take whatever crops we've grown. They've taken whatever we've built. And, and that's why he said they're in great distress. And, and, and they're, it's a huge reproach because all of the neighboring city states, they're just coming in and taking whatever we can do. And so when he heard these words, he sat down and he wept and he mourned for days. That's how much he cared. He wept and he mourned for days. Now, I don't know if any of us see an eroded field a field that has obviously been abused, degraded. I don't know if we sat down and we weep and we, we mourn for days, but it should make us sad. And it should really make us sad if it's our ground or something connected to us or close to us because that should hurt. If you care, it should hurt. And Nehemiah cared and he hurt. So they cared deeply. Number two, they prepare thoroughly. He didn't just jump right in and start to try to make a plan and fix the problem. That's, that's part of my problem. 
Sometimes I, want to, I see a problem, I just want to jump right in and start fixing it. I don't prepare thoroughly enough sometimes. So that's why it's really good to have a team around me that can help with a lot of the preparation, help with that timing. Nehemiah, I believe, was inspired to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem right away. But before he started anything, he prayed and he fasted for four months. Now, I could take you through the verses where it shows this. One thing about the book of Nehemiah, it's very, very precise on the dates. He uses a lot of, in the month of, you know, in the such and such day of the such and such month of the reign of such and such. It's very precise on the date. So we can date things pretty exactly. So he prayed and he fasted for four months. Now, I don't know that that means he didn't do anything other than pray and fast. But he, he, he made that part of his daily routine for four months. That's how he was preparing to do this. And then number three, once you've cared and once you've prepared, you need to act. Because it's not enough to care. It's not enough to prepare if you don't ever do anything with it. At some point as a leader, you're going to have to act boldly. So here's what it says in, in chapter 2. And it came about that the wine was before King Artaxerxes. <clears throat> okay, so Nehemiah was bringing the wine. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And so the king said to me, why is your face sad though you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I want to stop right there and think about this. Here's the king of the most powerful nation on earth, and he is astute enough to notice that this, this slave, but I think that there was more of a relationship there than just a slave, he was able to notice that something was wrong with this guy, and further, it, he wasn't physically ill. He said, this is nothing but sadness of heart. I, I find that pretty impressive, actually. Are we observant enough with the people around us that we can not only see when somebody's struggling, but also ask, hey, what's, what's going on? doesn't seem like you're physically sick, but something's going on here. What's wrong? If a king can ask that to his slave, we need to be able to ask that to our family members, our coworkers, etc. So Nehemiah says, then I was very much afraid, and I said, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire. And then the king said to me, what would you request? And, and folks, at some point, it may be soon, it may be later, but at some point, every one of us in this room, as we're out there pushing soil health, regenerative agriculture, at some point, we're going to get in front of the right person. It might not be the king but it's going to be in front of some sort of a decision maker, policy maker, somebody of influence. At some point, they're going to ask us that question. What do you want to do? What do you want to do about it? And if you don't have an answer, you're going to look pretty silly. If you don't have an answer, it's because you cared deeply and you may have prepared, but you weren't ready to act boldly. So, what would you request? Are you ready for when somebody asks you that question? Hey, we've got all these problems. Yeah, everybody can see that. What do you want to do about it? <clears throat> what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Love this. Shoots up a little prayer. This is one of those, before you take a big test, just shoot that little prayer up. And I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I gave him a definite time. See, this tells me that he had done his homework. He had prepared. Not only had he prayed and fasted for four months, but I think he was doing a lot of figuring out how long would it take to do this because when the king said, well, okay, how long is it going to take? How long are you going to be gone? He had an answer. He had an answer. And we need to be ready to give that answer when somebody asks us, what would you want to do? I love that part. Number four of the right leaders. They humbly lead by example. In chapter five, Nehemiah says, I also devoted myself to working on the wall. Okay, so he wasn't just getting everybody else to do the work. He was right there beside him, working on the wall. And I refused to acquire any land. He was not using his position of leadership and power and influence to acquire all these riches. That, that, that shows 
how humble of a guy he was. Now, later he was, he, you know, he made different arrangements with the king. He was later installed as the governor of Jerusalem. And so there's a lot more to the story. But at least at this point, he was, he was right out there with everybody else doing the work. And number five, they share vision and they inspire courage. They inspire vision, or they share vision and they inspire courage. And we're going to look at how they do this as we look at the right workers because it's not enough as a leader to have vision. That vision does you no good unless you can transfer it to the people working with you and around you and for you. You have to share that vision. And then when things get tough, and in any big project, things are going to get tough, can you inspire courage in the people around you and the rest of your team? So I think that we've got the right leaders in this room. And every one of you here are a leader. And, and some of you may be going, well, you know, I'm not in charge of any you know, big, great things. Don't tell me I'm a leader. Well, you know what? You are. It may be at a fairly low level, just your own farm, your own family. And for some of you, it may be a next level up. You're on the board of the Soil and Water Conservation District or something like that. You know, it may be that you're on a, you know, church board. Each one of you have leadership positions. And so... As we go through this, as, as we go through this next three days, be thinking about what can you learn to help you be a better leader? What can you learn that's going to help you prepare thoroughly and then to act boldly? And so when that question comes, what would you do? You'll have an answer for them. So the right workers. It's great to have the right leaders, but if you don't have workers, the job's probably not going to get done. So number one, the right workers share a common vision. And this is leadership's responsibility to share this vision with them. Here's what Nehemiah says in, verse, in chapter 2. So I went up at night and I inspected the wall. The officials did not know where I had gone, nor had I told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said, and then I brought them all together, and I said, look, guys, you see this bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And then they said, and these are the words I hope we leave this, this event with, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. That is sharing that vision. That is getting your vision across to people when, you know, this, this was a, you know, whether you call it a pregame speech or a halftime speech or whatever it is, they were inspired and they said, yes, let us get to the work. And they put their hands to the good work. So as a leader, again, it doesn't matter what level you're at, as a leader, you have to share that vision with the rest of your team. Number two, they're willing to learn. They're willing to learn. Look who he had to work with. He did not have a bunch of carpenters and stonemasons and trained tradesmen to do this. He says in there he had priests, the nobles, the officials, and, and I like how he says this, and then the, the ones who actually did the work. <laughs> so I had all these professional people, and then the ones that actually did the work. But none of them, none of them knew anything about building walls or working with stone. And so you have to be willing to learn as a good worker. Dedication to the cause is more important than a pre-existing skill set if the person is willing to learn. So if you're hiring people for whatever team you're on, it's probably more, much more important that they're dedicated to your cause, that they share your vision, than that they have tons of practical experience in whatever you're trying to accomplish. Because you can learn the skill sets and the, and, and the, you know, the day-to-day -day activities. You can't necessarily learn that passion and that vision. You have to come in with that. And so that's, that, that's you know, when you're looking for the right workers, find the ones who are willing to learn. Number three, they don't get overwhelmed. And it can be an overwhelming task. Look at what they are up against. Uh, the walls of ancient Jerusalem would have been a mile in circumference, average height of 15 feet, 12 feet wide at the bottom, going up to 7 feet wide at the top, 10 gates and 6 towers. They had unskilled workers in a hostile work environment, as we'll see. That's a lot. That's a big task. It's easy to get overwhelmed. And again, we can get overwhelmed pretty easily ourselves, 900 million acres of farmland, most of it's experienced some level of degradation, 10 billion people, they keep telling us we have to feed by 2050, and do we have a hostile work environment? Maybe, yeah. Some of you more than others, but we are not always supported the way that we would like to be. So how do you get workers to not be overwhelmed? Well, again, 
It comes back to leadership. But look what Nehemiah did. I love this. Very clever. He says, above the horse gate, the priests carried out repairs, each in front of his house. After them, Zadok, the son of Emmer, carried out repairs in front of his house. After him, Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, carried out repairs in front of his own quarters. So if you've got this giant project, tell people to focus on the portion of the work that God has given to them. And not to try to solve the whole problem, but fix what's right in front of you first. Number one, that's what's going to be most important to that particular person. And then once you get that fixed, now you can help your neighbor. Now you can help the rest of the community. Now you can start working on a gate. But build the wall in front of your own house first. Uh, Later on in chapter 4, he says, each one to his own work. And that doesn't mean that everybody's working independently, but it means you can focus on what's right in front of you. So in other words, we need to fix our own soils first, and then... Now we have an example. Now we have the experience. We can reach out to our neighbors. We can reach out to our community. We can reach out to our state. And we can help them do the same thing as well. But you've all been around people that are trying to get you to do something when they haven't done it in their own life. And you know how hypocritical that looks when somebody tries to get you to do something and they haven't done it themselves. So do your own work first. Focus on that portion of the work that God has given you to say grace over. Number four, they are courageous. You have to be courageous because not everybody's going to support your work. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. Not everybody's going to support your work. And I know, I've, you know, I know many of you, and I know some of your stories, you haven't always been supported in your communities, in your coffee shops. I would venture to guess that there are, that's very little coffee shop time spent with most of the people here. Number one, you're too busy. Number two, you don't find support there. And that's okay. You come here to find support, but not everybody's going to support that work. And you might even be ridiculed for your efforts. Look what he says in chapter 4. Sambalai became very angry, and he mocked the Jews. And he said to his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now Tobiah the Ammonite said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, it would break their stone wall down. Now, I don't think that was true, but he was making fun of them. You know, he was ridiculing them. And I would guess that most of you in here have been ridiculed at some level at some point in time for some of the things that you've done. Not everybody is going to support your works. And hopefully, none of us have been the subject of plotting and attacks, but maybe, maybe. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashadites, see they're recruiting more and more people now to come against the Jews. When they heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. Because if they have a wall, they can no longer come in and take everything they want. And they conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and cause a disturbance in it. Now, hopefully, you aren't being plotted against and having attacks come to you on your farm. But you know what? At some point, maybe. And maybe it's not a physical attack, but it might be some other type of attack. Uh, And so you have to be prepared for that. We have to be ready for that. So how do we get courageous workers? Again, it goes back to the leadership Leadership has to set that example. Nehemiah says, we prayed to our God, and because of them, because of these people that we're going to attack, we set up a guard against them day and night. Okay? So leadership had a plan. And number two, you have to be prepared, and you continue the work in spite of the threat. If you stop the work because of the threat, I I mean, that's the whole reason you don't negotiate with terrorists, because you just encourage more terrorists to do the same thing again. You have to continue the work in spite of the threats. And Nehemiah says those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took the load with one hand doing the work and the other hand holding a weapon. Okay, so they had a trowel in one hand and a sword or a knife or something in the other hand. They were ready. They were prepared, but they continued the work in spite of the threats. So, we're each leaders here, but we're also each workers here. Okay, so at some level you serve as a leader, and at some level, you're probably serving as a worker. And that's, that's perfectly fine. That's how it should be. So as a worker, you have to make sure you understand the vision. You have to be willing to learn. Don't get overwhelmed and be courageous. And again, hopefully these next three days will help prepare you uh, to be the right workers that we need to carry out these tasks. And then number three, we have to have the right tools because no project can be accomplished without having the right tools. 
Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what tools Nehemiah used. It really doesn't matter. They would have used the best tools they had available. They probably weren't great, but they used whatever they had available. I just found these on the internet, threw them out there. That's really not important. But what is important is what tools do we have at our disposal to do our task? Because that's what these next three days are going to be about. You're going to hear people up here talking about the tools that they're using on their own operations. And to set the stage for this, I want to just share with you these six fundamental truths of bio-grace. Some of you have heard this before, some of you may not have, but I want to go through these because I think they're really important because this is the fundamental building blocks of what we do as farmers. And in order to understand what these are, bio-grace is a term that I just kind of made up, so if you haven't heard of bio-grace, that's okay. It's, it's, it's biological grace. And really, to, to get that, you have to understand what true grace is. Something that is given to you by grace, number one, it's free. You can't buy it. Number two, it's undeserved. You can't earn it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace. And number three, it's unlimited. You're not going to run out of it. Otherwise, again, it's not by grace. And so, we have six things that, that we have access to uh, of, of bio grace. Now, the best example of true grace, of course is God sending his son Jesus to, to die on the cross for our sins. That's free. You can't buy that. You can do nothing to earn that. It's undeserved, and it's unlimited. The grace that I have does not take away from the grace that any of you have. But in addition to that, we have these things in agriculture. We have these tools that we can use that follow these same three principles, free, undeserved, unlimited. Number one, solar energy. It's limitless. It's free, and plants are the best way to capture, store, and convert it to something of value. Really, as farmers, this is what we grow. You know, we grow plants, but the reason is so they can photosynthesize and they can create that glucose molecule, which then gets converted into something of value. We're, we're sunlight harvesters, if you will. And, and I'm sure some people up here are going to be referring to that and talking about that. But solar energy is free. Have you ever thought about that? We don't have to pay for it. Now... Right now, we aren't taxed on it. I'm sure the government somewhere is talking about a solar tax, but, but it's free. It's there for the taking. We, don't, we can't buy it. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. You can do nothing to, to, to earn more sunlight, and, and it's unlimited. The sunlight that I get is not going to take away from the sunlight that Colton's going to have on his fields. That's, it's truly given to us by grace. And so photosynthesis is the way that we convert that into energy and into things of value. And so if you're in a corn bean rotation, folks, you're only capturing about 50% of the solar energy that hits the ground. You're wasting the other half. You're wasting the other half. So we need to put cover crops in wherever we can. That's the power of cover crops is it's capturing solar energy in time frames when our normal crops aren't. And then again, we can use livestock. There's going to be a great livestock panel up here. They're going to be talking about how do you convert that now to something of real value. And so maybe you're a wheat farmer. You know, we used, to, we used to grow wheat, and we thought we were really good farmers because we'd grow this wheat crop, we'd harvest it in July, and we would keep it perfectly clean until the next April or May. And, and, and we thought that was a sign of a good farmer. You didn't have any weeds growing out in your wheat stubble. Well, little did we know that we were, we were literally killing and starving off our biology. And now we understand that we're wasting so much. Yeah, you harvest wheat in, in July, that's some of the longest days of the year. There is so much solar energy lost when we don't have a cover crop out there to capture it at some point or some way. So solar energy, we have to capture it. It's the only way that we get new energy into the system. You know, people talk about old sunlight, new sunlight. Well, old sunlight is, you know, petroleum products. You know, gasoline, diesel, most electricity, you know, much of that is generated through the burning of fossil fuels. That's old sunlight, and they, they have a place. We need them. They're tools, but capturing the new sunlight and putting it into our operations is how we're really going to make progress. Number two, carbon is not a problem. Now, there's a lot of conferences that you can go to where carbon is widely discussed as the problem. Carbon is not a problem. It's free food for both plants and the biology. It's, it's, a, it's a big part of photosynthesis. You can't make glucose. You can't make C6H12O6 without CO2. 
And that's the basis of, of life. You know, you and I, we're, we're 18% carbon. Where does that carbon come from? Well, it comes from the food that we eat. Well, where did that carbon come from? Well, it came from a plant photosynthesizing at some point. So carbon is not a problem. It's free food for both plants and biology. Again, photosynthesis, we have to be utilizing this in order to get the carbon back where it goes. So I say carbon is not a problem. That doesn't mean we don't have problems with carbon. It's just that we need to put the carbon back where it belongs, and that's in the soil. And when, you know, I refuse to engage in global warming discussions, I just tell people, you know what, I don't know that I'm smart enough or qualified enough to talk about that, but this is what I do know. We need the carbon back in the soil where it belongs, and that's going to fix the problem. And, and that's, that's a good way to shift that conversation away from global warming to soil health. So you might try that. So here's how it works. And, and again, you folks all know this, but this will be widely talked about up here. We've got some really good biological people here. We've got some really smart people here when it comes to a lot of this, so make sure you take advantage of that. But the plants are producing carbon through photosynthesis. As much as 40 to 50% of that carbon is not used by the plant to grow. It's leaked out through the root system to feed the biology. But the biology has to deliver something back to the plant because just as in real life, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If the biology is not delivering a service back to the plant, the plant's going to say, no more. And so when you don't have any biology, your plants aren't putting the root exudates out into the soil, so you're not getting that liquid carbon out there. But when you do have biology, the plant is pumping this, these sugars, these carbon sugars, into the soil. Uh, here's what it looks like. These are a series of great pictures from Jimmy Emmons. Many of you know Jimmy. Jimmy's been to this event. In fact, Jimmy wanted to be at this event, but he's got his own conference uh, going on right now. So this, this is a uh, true story by Jimmy Emmons. So this was a cover crop rye that he planted. Uh, he planted it after wheat harvest. Uh, he, and he, and he pulled these up. He started digging out there later in the fall. So this rye was not real big, maybe, you know, eight, ten inches tall. So this is what the roots looked like, had beautiful roots. You can tell he's got good biology uh, with all of the, uh, the soil clinging to the roots. And he started digging and he, he, he's got a little he has a little thing called the proscope that he can put on his iPhone so it magnifies it. So all these pictures were taken by his iPhone. No, no microscopes here. So as he was digging this up, he saw this root. And, and you can see all those root hairs there. And this root was growing sideways through a worm tunnel or a worm burrow. So you can see all the soil around it. And that root was growing straight through there. And so it was not actually in the soil. And so it was undisturbed. He got to looking at that. And he, and he said, what are all those little droplets on those root hairs? And so he magnified it. And you can see over here on the right-hand side, look at all of these little droplets on all these root hairs. This is just a magnified version of this. <clears throat> those are the liquid carbon root exudates that are being pumped out into the soil by the plant to feed the biological activity, build the soil, and, and for the plant to get all these benefits from the biology. Now, you, you hardly ever see a picture like this because if it's growing in the soil, when you pull that root out, all those root hairs fall off. And if you're really, really careful, you can, you can take that, you can dip it in some water, do a root wash, you can preserve the root hairs, but in the process of doing that, of course, all those little liquid carbon droplets get dissolved in the water. So this is a very, very rare picture of seeing those liquid carbon root exudates being pumped out. Now, if you start doing the math, you know, how wide is a worm burrow? Well, it you know, depends on your worm, right? Sixteenth of an inch, an eighth of an inch maybe at the most. And that's all we're looking at here. It's a magnified version of maybe a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch. There are hundreds of droplets in that eighth of an inch. How big is the root system on a cereal rye plant? Well, it's massive. And how many rye plants do we have per acre? generally a million or more. So if you start doing the math, we're talking about hundreds of millions, if not a trillion, liquid carbon root droplets being pumped into the soil at any given time when you have a healthy soil system. So carbon is not a problem, we just need to put it back where it belongs. Number three, nitrogen is free and it's abundant. Nitrogen is free and it's abundant. There's no surprises here because you guys all know where I'm going with this, but in a lot of traditional farming circles, they would want to argue this point beyond any other. Because as a industry here in the U.S., we spent 
almost $5 billion on nitrogen fertilizer in 2023. I think it's like 4. Point, yeah, 4.8 billion in 2023. So how can I say nitrogen is free when as an industry we spent $5 billion putting it on? Well, if you look at the composition of our atmosphere, and I apologize, this is really hard to see, but this little sliver, carbon dioxide, little sliver here. And by the way, if you get in a global warming or a discussion with somebody, always ask them this question. So how much carbon is in the atmosphere? Most of them won't know. Most of them won't know how much. It's four one hundredths of one percent. It's not four percent. It's not four tenths of a percent. It's four one hundredths of one percent is carbon, CO2. That's not very much. But yet our plants can take that in and, and grow. However, nitrogen, it's this huge area. 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen above every acre of cropland in the United States, around the world. 30,000 tons of nitrogen. Just hanging out. It's just, that's part of the atmosphere. It's free for the taking, but the problem is, is it's pretty hard to take. And so that's why I say nitrogen is free and abundant. It's just not in the form that we can use because it's held in the atmosphere as dinitrogen. It's two nitrogen molecules bonded together with three sets of really strong covalent bonds. And if you remember your chemistry, it takes a lot of energy to break that. And so it renders it inert in the atmosphere. I can breathe it in, and because those nitrogen molecules are bonded to each other, it does nothing to my body. I breathe it right back out. And it's the same way with a plant. A plant takes in the atmosphere to get the CO2. It's taking in huge amounts of nitrogen, but God never designed plants to access that nitrogen directly from the atmosphere. They can't do it. They can't do it. And so what we have to do is we have to build these big factories. And these were, you know, built, you know, you know this, they were built during World War I and really ramped up in World War II, the Haber-Bosch method. We can now break that nitrogen bond and we can make, combine it with hydrogen and oxygen and we can make ammonia and nitrates and all these different things. And it becomes very powerful. It becomes very useful to the plant, but it's very expensive to do. And so when you look at how much you spend on nitrogen, you're not paying for the nitrogen. That's free. It's all over the place. You're paying for the energy that it takes to put the nitrogen into the right form. So it really shouldn't be part of your fertilizer budget. It should be part of the energy budget on a farm. <clears throat> but what it takes man billions of dollars to do, God has provided these tiny little organisms that do the same thing. So we got rhizobia bacteria. And again, you're all familiar with rhizobia. They will form symbiotic relationships with legume plants. And again, don't ever tell anybody or let anybody say, well, I'm growing soybeans, they can make their own nitrogen. Not true. They can't. They can't use atmospheric nitrogen, but they will work in conjunction with rhizobia to provide the nitrogen for them. And so, you know, we have soybeans and peas and alfalfa and all these legume plants that have that ability to form these relationships. The rhizobia are putting out the right chemicals, the right enzymes, and, and they are breaking that nitrogen bond in these little nodules, and they're combining it with hydrogen and oxygen and turning that into forms of nitrogen that the plant now can use. It's a beautiful system. It's almost like it was created that way. But it's not just for legumes. We've got other things. There's free living diazotrophs like azospirillum and azotobacter and bacillus and cyanobacteria. They're discovering new ones all the time. And these things are doing the same thing rhizobia do. They're breaking that bond of the dinitrogen. They're combining it with the right other elements. They're making it plant available. But these guys can do it for a corn plant, a plant, a grass plant, any plant. Anybody that's willing to pay these guys give them food because they can't eat nitrogen they have to have the carbon and so we've got this great system that God has created that the biology are making the nitrogen available to the plants now you might look at this and go well I've already paid my tuition here because I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna throw out buckets full of these things on my ground and grow 300 bushel corn well it's not always that simple you see rhizobia incredibly powerful because they form nodules and there are billions, billions of rhizobia in one of these nodules. Essentially, they're creating vast amounts of nitrogen. If you grow 70 bushel soybeans, 
That takes 350 to 400 pounds of nitrogen to do that. How many of us would grow soybeans if you had to apply 400 pounds of nitrogen to do it? Well, we wouldn't. But rhizobia can produce 400 pounds of nitrogen in 60 days. Incredibly powerful. These guys might produce 40 to 50 pounds in a year. Not nearly as powerful because they're working as single-celled organisms. But what does 50 pounds of nitrogen throughout the year do to a forage crop, to a grass crop, to a grazing crop? It can make all the difference in the world. And so it's not the only answer, but it should be part of the answer for the nitrogen problem. All right, number four, soils are rich in minerals and plant nutrients. You know, we talked about nitrogen, but we also spend a lot of money on phosphorus and potassium and iron and all these other trace minerals that when we send a soil test in, the lab sends back an analysis and says, well, you need to add this, 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 and this. Well, what they're telling you, they're telling you how many of the mineral nutrients in your soil are available to the plant. They're not telling you what's in your soil. And so if you really want to know what do you have in your soil, you have to do something like a total digestion nutrient or a total nutrient test, something like that, you can get that test and you can learn, folks, most of our soils have enough of these minerals to farm for thousands of years, but they don't show up on a soil test because they're not available to plants. And just like God never made plants to pull nitrogen directly out of the atmosphere, he didn't make plants to pull the minerals directly out of the soil, it has to go through the bugs, it has to go through the biology. I love this article that was in Scientific American. It says mycorrhiza fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. I love it because when you think of a mining operation, you think of this enormous equipment. You know, one truck that has a tire the size of a house. You've all seen those pictures. But they're saying the largest mining operation in the world, you can't even see it unless you have a pretty good microscope. That's pretty cool. And so what's happening is you've got this little piece of feldspar over here on the right. And, and look at these, it's got these little tunnels, these little channels. That's actually mine shafts. Those are hollowed out spaces inside that little soil particle. And it's being done by mycorrhiza, which looks like this. And again, we've got some really good mycorrhizal experts here, so make sure uh, you visit with them. Willie Pretorius, where's Willie at? Yeah, Willie's right here. He's with Ward Labs. He knows way more about mycorrhiza than probably anybody else in this room. So if you have mycorrhiza questions, talk to Willie. But essentially this mycorrhiza is forming these arbuscles inside this plant root. And then these aren't root hairs. This is mycorrhiza hyphae coming out into the soil. And that's what is burrowing into this. Uh, both it, it creates the right chemicals and the right enzymes and it actually cultivates the right type of bacteria to dissolve solid rock, solid mineral, turns it into liquid mineral and it delivers it right back to its host plant in exchange for the carbon. And so, so much of the fertilizer that we put on, if we had the right biology in our soil, we could be pulling that out of our soil and we wouldn't have to be applying it. So number five, the fifth principle, and again, remember, these things are free. I don't have to pay for that carbon. I don't have to pay for that nitrogen in the atmosphere. I don't pay for that solar energy. I don't pay for those minerals. Well, I guess when I bought the land, I did, but they're there for the, you know, for the acquisition. <laughs> they're undeserved, and, and they're virtually unlimited. And number five, soil biology makes the system bigger, faster, stronger, and more efficient. And I've, I've been talking about that for these last several you know, soil biology is what is converting that nitrogen to be available. It's what's mining those minerals and making it available. Biology drives the system. However, you can't have any biology in your soil without a plant out there. Because as powerful as the biology is, the only way that they're going to exist, the only food source that they have is going to be that liquid carbon red exudate. So if you don't have a plant growing in the soil to feed them, to host them, to give them a habitat to live in, the biology is not going to be there. So which is more important? Well, they're both more important, and they depend upon each other. So the biology makes that system bigger, faster, stronger, more efficient. We're going to have a whole panel uh, talking about soil biology, and again, I know there's lots of people here that have done lots of Johnson Sioux at home and other types of biological extracts. I would predict that some of the richest conversations that will happen over the next three days will be around some of these biological topics, and they should be. 
You know, it's a fascinating area of farming. It's one that we don't know nearly enough about, and even the experts will tell you that they only know a fraction of what's out there to be learned. I frankly find that very exciting. It's exciting to know that there's undiscovered things out there that we can learn and we can get even better at as we discover uh, both new organisms and new ways to use them uh, in the system the way that God created it. And then number six, water is essential for all life and processes. That's the sixth truth of BioGrace. Now you may say, okay, water, is it free? Well, you know, rainwater is. You don't pay for it. Sometimes we wish we could. And for those who have some irrigation, you can. I'm not talking about irrigation here. I'm talking about rain. So, yes, it is free. It's given to us by grace. Is it undeserved? Well, yes. I don't think that you get discriminated on. You know, the Bible says that God makes it rain on the just and the unjust alike. Uh, again, we don't always get what we want, but we can't do anything extra to deserve extra rainfall. Is it unlimited? Is it unlimited? Well, <clears throat> we could spend quite a bit of time arguing about this, but Colton's going to come up here and steer wrestle me off the stage in eight minutes. I can't get into that discussion. <clears throat> it's unlimited in the fact that all of the rain you get is available to be used. But most of us, well, not most of us in this room, but most agriculture people waste a lot of the rain that they get. Some of you have seen this picture. It's from Russ Jackson took this. Russ is a farmer in Oklahoma. Uh, uh, he actually grows some seed for us, uh, some of the rye seed, Elbon rye. He's one of our growers. So this was a rainfall event uh, in, in uh, western Oklahoma, same soil type. Big rainfall event, 5.3 inches fell overnight. And he came out, was driving down the road, and he took this picture because these are the same soils on this side and this side. Now, some people say, well, this guy just had a lot of slope and it all ran to the ditch. Well, no, it was that way across the whole field. And so he had, this, the neighbor had infiltration rates of 0.6 inches per hour. And that five inches came in about an hour. It was one of those big rainstorms. And as, as I go around and I talk, uh, you know, farmers have varied opinions on global warming, climate change, all things like that, and that's great. Almost every farmer, though, will tell you, if you ask them, our rainfall events are less frequent and they're more intense. Pretty much everybody agrees with that. Okay, so a big rain, six-tenths of an inch an hour, he got 16,000 gallons of water in his soil, the rest either ran off or evaporated away. Russ, on the other hand, uh, and so the neighbor was conventional tillage, uh, just growing wheat, uh, no cover crops, no grazing. Russ had a, a good crop rotation. He's gross cover crops, planned grazing management. And so he had it, and, and the NRCS had been out uh, just a couple weeks before that and tested his soil. He knew exactly what his infiltration rate was, six inches an hour, six inches an hour, because they had tested it. Well, 5.3 is less than six. So guess what? He got it all. That rainfall event was unlimited for him because he took it all into his soil and he was able to utilize 144,000 gallons of water for growing his next crops, for making his next system work. And so, yeah, we could argue about that, but we don't even take advantage of the rainfall that we get when we get it and then we still complain about not having enough. So the thing about grace is, it does you no good if you don't do something to accept it. If you don't do something to grasp it, you have to do something to implement it and integrate it into your lives. Otherwise, it's just something that's setting out there. It sounds really good. It looks really good. But unless you're specifically doing something to get it integrated into your lives, it's not going to help. So, you know, in the case of, of the example of, you know, God sending his son Jesus, that does you no good if you don't accept that grace into your life. And all of these other things do you no good the, the sunlight, the carbon, the nitrogen, the minerals, the biology, the water. You have to do something to get them into your system. And so I'm not going to go through these because you all know them. They will be talked about up here, but we need to keep the soil covered. We need to minimize the disturbance. This, these are the soil health principles. We need to maximize the diversity. We need living roots as often as possible, and we need to properly manage livestock, properly integrate managed livestock into the system. And when we do that, 
now we're applying those biological graces to our system. That's how we integrate them into our lives. And so these big projects, all of this overwhelming stuff in front of us, looks a lot less daunting when we have the right leaders, the right workers, and the right tools. So as we close, how long did it take Nehemiah and the Jews to rebuild the wall? Remember, it was nearly a mile in circumference, 15 feet high, 12 feet wide, 10 gates, unskilled workers. Again, Nehemiah has very exact lines in the book, and it tells us in chapter 6, so the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elul in, any thoughts on how long it took him? 52 days. 52 days. Now, unless you knew the story of Nehemiah, you're probably thinking, oh golly, five years, ten years, government project, 50 years. <laughs> 52 days. That is shocking. That is shocking. But Nehemiah applied these right principles. So, how long will it take us to rebuild our soils? Well, I'm not here to tell you we can do it in 52 days. But it's not going to be as long as the experts tell us. You know, the experts will tell you it takes a thousand years to build an inch of topsoil. And that's true if the only thing that we're relying on is the weathering of rocks. But folks, we've got all of these tools. We've got all of these biological graces. We can do way better than just weathering rocks down to create our soil. And so when we put the right leaders and the right workers and the right tools together, we can rebuild our soils much, much more quickly than that. So as we close, I just wanted to have a little bit of a final discussion about this Sabbath rest for the land. Because people do ask about that. Hey, should we be letting our land rest every, se every seventh year? Well, it's a good question. <clears throat> now, I don't believe that we're still under that commandment from God. That was, that was specific to the Jews at that time. And I don't believe that that's an edict or a commandment from God for us. However... God didn't just tell them to do that because he was trying to control them. There's a reason of why he wanted them to do that. And, and so we need to look at what was the reason for that and, and how, can that, how can we apply that to our lives today. And so, you know, I do know some people that, that do give a Sabbath rest. You know, they won't take a crop off once every seven years. Uh, Rick Clark talks about having a regenerative year within his system where, you know, he's not harvesting grain, he's just grazing it with livestock, and he'll take that whole year to kind of reset the system and rebuild it. <clears throat> now, many of us, many of us probably can't afford to give up a cash crop once every seven years. So if you think about it, <clears throat> what would happen? I mean, the, the reason that God told him to do that is because the land does need to rest and recover. And here's a very common fallacy. Giving that Sabbath year rest does not mean nothing is growing. That is the absolute worst thing you could do for your soil is to have clean, bare fallow. You know, in our wheat stubble example I talked about earlier, we had 10 months of nothing growing out there. That was not letting the land rest. That was starving the system. And so that would not be considered, based on what we know now, as having a rest for the land. The rest happens when you allow these plants to grow, when you allow the biology to flourish, and you don't take things away from the system. You're not exporting via a truck or a hay bale. And so what if we did that every year? What if we took one-seventh of every year and had something growing without removing anything. So 365 days divided by seventh, what's one seventh of a year? 52 days. Now, I'm not saying that that's, I, I, is that a coincidence that it's the same amount of time it took them to rebuild the walls? I don't know, but I thought it was pretty cool. But when people ask us, how long does a cover crop need to grow before you get, you know, the majority of the benefits? And before I even ever looked at any of this, I would just tell them, probably seven weeks. You can get the majority of the benefits in cover crop growth in seven weeks. That's 49 days. That's pretty close. So I think that we can accomplish, and, and again, I don't think that we're under a statute or a requirement to do this, but I think we can accomplish that rest and rebuilding for the land that God was wanting the Jews to do I think we can accomplish that. If you can have a cover crop or some crop growing out there for about seven weeks 
And that doesn't mean it's going to get huge. You may be in a rainfall-limited environment. You may be in a situation where you don't get massive amounts of growth. But if you can have something growing out there, it can rebuild your soils, and it can give this rest for the land that God wanted the Jews to do even back then. So if we can get something planted and, and let it grow for 52 days, seven weeks, and, and I asked Chris Nichols, many of you know Chris, very widely respected soil biologist, this question, I said, how long does a cover crop have to grow before you feel like you kind of got your, at least your money back, a break even? And she kind of thought about it for a little bit, and she said, 30 days. If you can get 30 days of growth, and, and in 30 days, you'll have much more root development than you will above ground development, but that's what she looks at. And she thinks in 30 days, you'll at least break even seven weeks. You can get the majority of it out of there. So the rest of the conference is going to be dedicated to looking at a lot of these principles, a lot of these tools, a lot of these concepts. And you'll be hearing from people that know a whole lot more than I do up here. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it very much.